Uh, well, we're uh, in Ephesians 6, uh, again, uh, towards the, uh, the end of our time uh, in the book. Two more uh, messages, um, which uh, happen to be part three and four of Paul's last section in the epistle on, on, on spiritual warfare. And we're going to look at uh, three more parts of the uh, armor this uh, morning. Uh, and then, <clears throat> very importantly, the last section, and appropriately, is, uh, is on prayer. And uh, just to remind us of a couple of things we looked at already. And one of them I thought about <clears throat> this week as I was driving from uh, Kaneohe over, you know, by Castle High School. I'm coming over the Saddle Road. I'm coming under the H3 uh, overpass. <clears throat> and I see a person uh, in a white SUV waiting to, to merge out in front of me. I'm not sure why they're waiting because there's no one there. I don't know if they're on a cell phone or what, but they are, they're down there. And I see out of the corner of my eye a very large cement truck, very large, uh, moving rapidly down. And I, I'm hitting my brakes and slowing up to make sure he knows, yeah, just keep going right in front of me. Uh, what was interesting is, though, uh, is this whole thing kind of starts going into slow motion uh, because uh, I, I realize that the person in the SUV doesn't realize that their SUV is about to be ready to be turned into a tin can by the large truck quickly approaching them, and they're still just sitting there. And I'm like, I don't know if you do that. I talk to other drivers, and this is I'm talking loud. Go! Go! You know, it's a, like as though they could hear me. And, uh, uh, and then sure enough, the truck... The truck now locks up his brakes, you know, smoke coming out the back of the truck, still sitting there. And at the last minute, they, they, they leisurely pull out in front of me and drift in the other lane. And I know that they were completely unaware of what was transpiring around them. And that was uh, one of our first points, is that in terms of spiritual warfare, sometimes as believers, we're like that. Uh, things are going on that are very abnormal uh, in, in a distressing sense. And, uh, and we, we just think we're having a bad day and a bad week and the world's against me. And, and we kind of forget this idea of spiritual warfare and what's going on uh, in, the, in the heavenlies. Uh, again, John tells us in 1 John 5, 19 that we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one, the whole world. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, Paul says, But even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on, on them, uh, unaware of what's, uh, what's going on. As that uh, great uh, prophet of long ago, Bob Dylan, once said, When a man is born again, the sparks begin to fly. And, uh, and it happens when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, there is a war that is engaging around us whether we're aware of it uh, or, or not. And we've been trying to answer the question in terms of how are we to be victorious uh, when these spiritual attacks come upon us. And last time we noted the first three parts of the, uh, uh, the Roman soldier's uniform that Paul is using as a metaphor here. And we said we must be personally committed to the truth, the belt of truth. Uh, we said uh, our little key phrase there, uh, the belt is what gets it all together. Roman soldier had to literally gird himself up uh, to go uh, uh, into warfare. Uh, the belt gets it all together. We have to be committed to the truth. And, uh, and in that, we're talking about the truth uh, of the inerrancy of God's word. We've got to be committed to that or we're going to be in trouble against the enemy. And secondly, we have to have that truthfulness or that personal integrity in our own lives. Secondly, we answered the question by saying we have a vital protection that must be used, the breastplate of, uh, of righteousness. And we talked about what it means in terms of positional righteousness, the righteousness that is, uh, uh, again, imputed or given to us when we come to faith uh, in Jesus Christ. But once again, uh, there's a personal application. We need to stay current in our relationship with the Lord. Uh, again, it's those uh, small, uh, it's the small sins that the, that the devil looks to exploit. And we talked about that breastplate can get some pukas in it. Uh, and we need to be coming back to the Lord. Again, if we uh, see we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us 
from all unrighteousness, like the Roman soldier who kept that breastplate so polished he could see his face in it. Uh, we need to do the same thing in terms of our own personal walk with the Lord. And then the third thing is we have uh, the peace of God that comes from the gospel. And again, that's uh, related to the idea of the shoes uh, of the Roman soldier. Again, the importance of Paul in chapter 2, verse 8 to 10, our understanding that we're saved by, by grace and by grace alone. Uh, we ended by saying that every part of the armor uh, is based upon a relationship with Jesus Christ, and we're going to continue to see that this week. Well, let's back up to verse 14, but we really want to get to 16 and 17. Again, Paul writing Ephesians 6, chapter 6, verse 14. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all, taking the shield of faith with which you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So uh, we note first here the shield of faith is uh, very important. It's just it's trusting the promises of God. That's what's uh, being spoken about here. And I think we've got a little slide of, of, the, uh, of the shield and just to talk about that uh, a little bit. Uh, and we'd say first that, again, that our, it's our faith in God's promises uh, that are compared to the shield itself. Uh, again, there was a small uh, rounded shield uh, that's, uh, that the Romans used. That is not the one we're talking about. It's the, a larger one, uh, laminated wood. You can see it has a curvature to it. Um, uh, the word in, in Greek is a, is a very similar word to door because it was about the size of a door, typically about two feet uh, by four feet. It uh, uh, had uh, iron all the way around the uh, edges of it, covered with leather, uh, so that when a, a flaming arrow hit it, again, uh, the opposition would very often dip the arrow in tar, light it on fire, and then shoot it uh, into the ranks uh, of, the, of the Romans. As long as they had their shield up, uh, it hit uh, the shield. Uh, the leather would not burn uh, in the, the uh, again, the phrase here is the fiery dart would then uh, be, uh, be quenched. It was enough to uh, a Roman soldier could pretty much protect his whole body uh, with it. And they marched in what we described last week as a phalanx. It could be anywhere from two, 200 yards long to five miles long. And, uh, and we, again, we talked a little more about uh, uh, tactics that they used. And, and, uh, and they, were, they, were, uh, they, were, they were awesome. I mean, again, the, the Romans have no culture of themselves. They just take uh, uh, what they get from the Greeks. Uh, but, uh, but they were incredible in terms of the military, incredible in terms of building and, uh, and architecture. Uh, the other thing about this is that uh, they had the ability and the training to lock these shields together, uh, not only in terms of around them, but across the top of them. Uh, and it was uh, an amazing, amazing tactic. And if you've seen some of the movies that have been made in the last couple of years, uh, you understand what I'm talking about in terms of the phalanx and their ability. I, I did... I did look at a couple of those this week and thought, yeah, that's really awesome, but I don't know if I want to, but also in these scenes are people being beheaded and stabbed and body parts flying, so I didn't think it would be appropriate for Sunday morning. But if you've seen any of these movies, the, the Roman phalanx was amazing, uh, and that's the description. That's what Paul's talking about here. Uh, we'd also note, again, that uh, uh, here's the idea that we don't fight the enemy alone. Uh, you can't lock your shield with invisible people <laughs> Uh, they, they were uh, so great at this because of the way they uh, were so disciplined and, uh, and marched together and, uh, and communicated uh, one, to, one to another. Uh, that's the shield itself historically. We'd say that our shield will protect us, again, as we trust the promises of God. The faith here is not saving faith. Uh, it's uh, believing and trusting in the promises of God. <laughs> Satan shoots those fiery darts. Uh, when they come, we need to be able to lift up our shield. Uh, and trust uh, God's promises to us. Uh, what are the arrows themselves? Well, again, they are shot primarily. Again, the metaphor, it's thoughts. It's thoughts that come to our minds. Sometimes it's something someone says that's up. <laughs> it's like, wow, that kind of pierced there. I didn't quite have my shield up because sometimes it's from another Christian. Uh, you know, uh, it's things people say. It's primarily thoughts that come to our mind that are completely alien. We're just minding our business, and you know, all of a sudden there's just uh, 
thought, this horrific thought comes to our mind that's very, very distressing. And it's almost like, where, where did that come from? You know, there's a, you know, there are legitimate fears that we should, you know, have in life and valid and so forth and use wisdom because of them. Uh, but this is the abnormal, the alien that just kind of comes in. It's like, where did that come from? Uh, we need to recognize uh, what it is. There are arrows of sensuality that seek to light a flame within us. Uh, and again, we can, we can have that thought come. We can recognize where it's coming from. Uh, we can get our shield up. We can be begin to contemplate and meditate and think about uh, the promises of God to us as it applies to that particular attack. Uh, so the, it, it requires some Bible knowledge, doesn't it? You're, you're going you're gonna to just see that as we, as we go through, uh, through this, especially as we get to the sword of the Spirit. Uh, or we could just rationalize. Well, everybody does that. Everybody thinks that. The guys at work always say that, you know, you can, you can do the rationalization in your mind. That's not much of a defense, actually. It's giving in to the enemy. Rather, when that arrow comes, we should think about what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as com is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape so that you may be able to, uh, to bear it. That's, that's a pretty good promise to hang on to uh, in the midst of uh, an arrow, a thought that's coming to your mind. Uh, there is a way of escape. I can bear up under this. God says so. Uh, and this is common. This is, I'm not unique. This is not a unique situation. This is not a unique relationship. It's just common. Everybody gets this. Uh, Satan attacks us all uh, in this area. I can, I can get my shield up and start believing in the promises of God, or I can give in. And what happens then? It leads to some kind of temptation. It comes as a thought. It's a spiritual attack. It's not your fault. <laughs> you, you haven't done anything wrong. It's just like, oh, that was a weird thought. I'm a much more corrupt person than I thought. No, actually, it's just the enemy attacking you. Uh, you just need to get your shield up, uh, get your mind on the word of God. Uh, second uh, arrow is typical is materialism. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's a thought that says you need to change your priorities of your lives. Uh, that, uh, uh, you know, you're spending way too much time you know, reading your Bible. You're spending way too much time at church. Uh, you know, you're not working enough. You're not doing this enough. You're not buying, whatever it might be in terms of materialism. Uh, and, of course, we've got, um, <laughs> we've got uh, television uh, to, uh, to help us in this area. Uh, because uh, about every six minutes, there's a 12-minute commercial uh, that is there to tell you what you really need. You didn't know you needed your carpets to smell like lemon, did you? You know, but you do. You know, it's, it's just interesting if you think about it. Do I, do I really need all of these things? And they're there trying to, they are there to create a dissatisfaction in your life. If they don't create a dissatisfaction in your life, you won't buy their products. Uh, again, it's, I'm not saying that don't watch TV, but just recognize we have a culture. The whole world is under the sway. That word is, uh, means control uh, of, the, of the evil one. Uh, some, some of this stuff isn't helping us out here, uh, in other words. We just need to be, uh, be aware of it. Sometimes the arrow is materialism. There's arrows of criticism, uh, of rejection. There's arrows that come during a time of tragedy and illness. Uh, the enemy... Satan will watch you, and we talked about that uh, on another occasion. He watched David for decades, waiting for the right moment to attack. An illness, a tragedy, and all of a sudden, boom, the arrows uh, begin to come. There's arrows of doubt of God's goodness, the truth of the gospel, uh, and even his uh, e existence. It's no exaggeration to say that during our lifetime, we probably receive multiple thousands of deadly arrows shot at our souls, by an enemy that's very real, and the answer is faith. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John 5, 4, <clears throat> and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Ken Hughes says that faith binds us in vital, deep union with God. Faith is not just belief, it's belief plus trust. It is resting in the person of God uh, and his word to us. Again, uh, the arrow tries to get us primarily to distrust God, his character and his word. And we see that in the very temp first temptation. With, uh, with Eve in the garden, uh, uh, again, 
You have Satan, in terms of the serpent there, come along and say, did God really say? Can you really trust God's word? Uh, if you eat the fruit, you'll be like God himself. He doesn't really want the best for you. He's holding out on you. You need to have it your own way. And, uh, and again, that's, that's the temptation. Uh, most temptation comes down to that. It's an attempt to get us to mistrust God's character uh, and or God's word. And we see that certainly in Matthew 4, recorded also in Luke 4, uh, in the temptation of Jesus. And we'll, we'll look at that in some detail in a moment when we get to the sword of the spirit. So the shield of faith is simply just trusting in the promises of God. You've got to get your shield up when that thought comes for when that, that remark is made uh, that leads to this stress, it seems like it's uh, out of nowhere. We need to recognize we're under attack and then appropriate uh, uh, a promise uh, that will defend us uh, in, that, in that time of need. Secondly, our salvation is pictured in the helmet itself. Uh, again, the, uh, I have uh, <coughs> a slide of that for you, but uh, uh, it's... Uh, uh, salvation picture here in terms of the Roman helmet. Uh, two types, the galea, which is made of leather, the more familiar one, the casus or the metal uh, helmet. And probably you've seen enough in this illustration how it uh, gives great protection. Its helmet, uh, about the only thing that could penetrate the metal helmet would be a, a heavy blow with an ax or a, 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 a shot with a kind of a hammer type device that they would sometimes fight with. But it gave, gave great protection for, uh, for the head. <clears throat> and it uh, pretty much only left exposed the eyes and the nose uh, and uh, in the mouth. But as you'll note there in the illustration, one of the most uh, <clears throat> outstanding characteristics is just the, the red sash uh, on, the, on the top. I and mean, that's what Paul has in mind. The Romans had it there for a reason. <clears throat> they said that red, red is to remind you that when you go into the battle, that's the blood of your enemies. And that's what's going to happen. Uh, again, these guys were fierce warriors. Uh, and uh, even symbolized in the, the helmets that they, they wore. Uh, that red sash represented blood. Paul, again, uh, handcuffed, you know, attached, chained to a Roman soldier. Hey, that helmet reminds me of the blood also. Of course, it's the blood of, uh, of Jesus Christ. So we'd say, secondly, uh, there's a specific aspect of our salvation that's pictured in the helmet. If we're talking about the, uh, the helmet of salvation, uh, we're not talking about our salvation in terms of a past tense. Uh, we come to faith in Jesus Christ. He saves us from our sins. There's no longer any condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Uh, there's salvation, we'd say, in a present tense. Uh, our daily lives in terms of our relationship, what we might call sanctification, uh, God's Spirit working and changing uh, uh, our hearts and minds. Uh, and, of course, the, the future tense we call glorification. And I think that uh, uh, is what exactly Paul has in mind here. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of verses to uh, support that idea here. Uh, we mentioned that uh, two of these things uh, are, uh, uh, are in the Old Testament. Uh, Paul, again, Jewish rabbi, is drawing a lot here from the Old Testament. Uh, and one of the verses is from uh, Isaiah 59.7. Uh, we read in a little more detail last time, but remember, this is a picture of, of Jesus Christ. He returns to planet Earth. He will. He's going to return to planet Earth. We will, the church, return with him. And when he does, he will be the conquering king, and he will go across this planet in a couple places in particular, uh, destroying the forces of the Antichrist and those that are with him and so forth. Uh, and in the process of when the, when the Savior, the Messiah, comes out of Zion, Isaiah prophesies in Isaiah 59, 7. Notice, for he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for his clothing was clad with zeal uh, as, uh, as a cloak. And, and uh, that chapter and the one after it continued to describe uh, those events that are still yet future. Now notice what Paul does here. Paul changes the image. In Isaiah's picture of this prophecy of future, uh, God's helmet of salvation is what he does. Uh, but in this image here, God's helmet of salvation is what he gives. Uh, it's not what he does, it's what he gives. Our salvation is what God has given to us. For we are saved by grace through faith. It's the gift of God. 
not that of work, so that no one can boast. Uh, it's given to us. The helmet of salvation is our assurance of our salvation. Uh, and we need it when we're under attack, <laughs> don't we? That, that's one of the arrows, isn't it? That gets you to doubt your, your own salvation and your own relationship with, uh, with Jesus Christ. It's, it's meant, this helmet is meant to be a confidence uh, builder. And uh, I couldn't help but think about uh, uh, guys in the NFL getting ready for a game and putting on their helmet. And, if, of course, if you're a, you're a football fan, you'll relate to this. But uh, if you're not, uh, just bear, bear with me for a moment. But uh, uh, <clears throat> I'll tell you what they do before the game. They put that helmet on. They cinch it up. And they're on the sidelines. And it's kind of funny. They're just smashing each other's helmets, you know. And then they'll headbutt butt each other with their, their helmets on. What are they doing? They're building confidence. It's like, that doesn't hurt. Let's go hit some people. I mean, this helmet is all about confidence. Uh, and that's the, I, uh, the idea here. Uh, my helmet's on, uh, and so I can take it. The helmet assures me that whatever happens to me, whatever I'm going through, whatever spiritual attack I'm under, one day I will be with Jesus Christ for all eternity. That makes a difference when the enemy is attacking you. That's the idea. Again, the helmet of salvation is not talking about past tense in salvation. It's not even talking in the present tense in terms of sanctification. It's really talking uh, about uh, the future. The helmet infuses optimism in a world of battle. Paul says in, this in Philippians 1.6 that we, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day uh, of Jesus Christ. I remember as a uh, as a pretty young Christian, uh, and, uh, uh, and hearing that verse and hearing somebody teach on that uh, verse, probably Pastor Chuck via, uh, via uh, tape, uh, and, uh, and taking my felt tip pen on my workbench and, and writing it out. It just meant so much to me because it's like I just, I just needed to know. I grew up in a church where it seemed like people came and went. Uh, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't going to be that guy. I wanted to know that he was going to truly complete the work that he had begun in my life. The helmet is meant to instill still hope. This is how Paul uses this phrase uh, in, uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5 eight. Uh, very key here for what, uh, what we're seeing. Uh, there he writes, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith uh, and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. See, that's future tense. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, uh, we should live together with him. He's actually talking about the rapture here. I, I, I just uh, kind of chuckled to myself. It's like, this is, uh, this is like a rapture helmet we're talking about here. You know, he didn't appoint us, he didn't appoint us to suffer wrath. We're going to be out of here. You know, that helps, you know, when, you're, when things aren't going well. You know, I mean, just in daily life when things aren't going well. Uh, it, uh, but man, when you're under spiritual attack, uh, this idea of the future tense, the hope of salvation, the helmet that we have uh, on our heads. Uh, and John uh, the Apostle says this about that glorious future uh, with Jesus Christ. First John 3, 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him, beloved. Now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he, Jesus, is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in himself, in him, purifies himself just as he is pure. Uh, so when we see him, we will be like him. This is all about a future tense of salvation. So the shield of faith is... Trusting and believing the promises of God when those fiery darts come. Our salvation is pictured as a helmet, and it's very much a future tense of being with the Lord for all eternity. Uh, and then three, the sword of the Spirit is the power of God. Uh, we see that in verse, uh, verse 17, and, uh, and we have a slide of this. This uh, uh, is uh, called the Machaira. We've talked about that a little bit. This is uh, uh, basically a a long dagger uh, that the Roman soldier would use for hand-to-hand -hand combat. Larger, there were larger swords that they were used, but this is the one that Paul is, is describing here. And then secondly, the power of uh, God's, we're seeing as revealed in a specific use 
of God's word to defend ourselves. And the, uh, the uh, optimum word here is the word, word for, for sword. Uh, Paul, there's a couple of words that Paul could have used. He could have said, uh, in the, uh, and the sword of the spirit is the logos of God. He could have used that very familiar Greek term, uh, meaning God's word in its entirety. You know, and, and uh, uh, there's a reference in Hebrews uh, about that. Uh, the word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. It says that it even penetrates our thoughts and our minds uh, and so forth. And there it's, it's reference to the word of God in general as a whole. That's not the word that Paul chose to use here. He chose to use a Greek word, rhema. Uh, rhema means a specific word of God for a very specific uh, situation. There's a Greek dictionary says it's a declaration of one's mind made into words. If we're going to have any impact on the enemy, those words that we use that are specific better be God's. There better be God's. Now, it's interesting to me, I, and, I, and we're going to spend a bit of time on this, and it's uh, beautifully illustrated in the life of Jesus in Matthew 4, and how he used the rhema word of God to defeat the enemy. And just in my uh, reading through commentaries this week, people that I love and respect and, uh, and so forth, you know, it, it's interesting how, uh, you know, how many, how many guys kind of avoid uh, this, this very thing that, that I think is critical uh, that uh, even discuss. And, uh, and it occurred to me, and thinking about it, praying about it, I understand why. Uh, and it's because, it's because if you maybe have heard that phrase before somewhere, it's, this phrase and this word has kind of been hijacked uh, by the uh, name it and claim it folks. Uh, they're all about the rhema word of God, uh, if you, if you hear, hear them. Uh, their, their theology uh, is not only incorrect, it's blasphemous. Because it's all predicated on a, a belief that Jesus' death on the cross was not sufficient for our sins. And that Jesus then was punished in hell for three days and three nights. But he spoke the rhema word of God, and there was power in his words, and that's how he was delivered out of hell. And therefore, if you speak... In faith, the rhema word of God, there's power in your words, and you can have what you want, whether it's health and wealth and, uh, and so forth. Uh, this is uh, Copeland, Hagen, Derek Prince. We could go down the list. There's the more modern versions uh, of, of those guys and so forth. It's a blasphemous theology, uh, and it's horrific. And I think because uh, they use that phrase, the thing I'm talking about here, the rhema word of God, in a really horrific way, I think a lot of writers and teachers have stayed away from it, uh, but uh, and just so we're not confused. What I'm talking about, and we're going to illustrate it, is we're talking about the Bible. We're talking about a Bible verse. We're talking about taking out God, that sword that is a specific Bible verse, not my words, not my faith, not what I conjure up. It's a specific word that will, that will draw blood to Satan. He comes to me, I lift up my shield, and I, I let him shoot those darts, but I believe and trust the character of God and God's word. I hang on to his promises. I've got my helmet on, and whatever is going to come on my, top of my head, it doesn't matter because I'm going to be with Jesus Christ for all eternity one day. I can take a couple of blows uh, along the way. But if I want him off my back, I better be able to draw out my sword and draw blood so, so he'll... He'll soon depart, uh, is, the, is the idea. It's exactly what uh, Jesus does uh, in Matthew 4. I want to give you one more uh, reference before we even get there. Paul uses it uh, in, in speaking of salvation, just again as an illustration so we understand what we're talking about in Romans 10, 5, uh, 10 15. Again, the context is, um, you know, how, how, will they, how will they hear unless someone preaches? How will they preach unless they're sent? You know, how beautiful of the feet are of those that have good news. This passage is about salvation. Uh, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? From Isaiah 53. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's a pretty familiar verse to most of us. I think primarily use that in context most of the time. That word is not logos. It doesn't mean faith comes by hearing, by, by the Bible, by God's word in its entirety. It means by rhema, a specific word. What's the word there? It's the gospel. 
How do people, the faith that's being spoken about is saving faith. How are people uh, coming to Christ? How do people come to Christ? It's by a specific word of God for a specific situation. In this situation, it's the gospel. Uh, you may have friends that don't know the Lord. Uh, and you believe that uh, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And you share a wonderful story to them about Noah. And they understand that there's a judgment of God, but they're not saved. You might tell them even about Jesus Christ uh, returning to planet Earth and what that's going to be like. Or some, some reference to prophecy uh, that they're interested in. And you're believing that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That's not what this passage is talking about. People get saved by those words, the gospel. Jesus died for our sins. If we place our faith in him, repent of our sins, he will forgive us our sins. Uh, write our names in heaven. Give us the, it's the gospel. That's what saves people. Uh, do you understand what I mean? So it's not a generic word here. It's very specific. Faith, saving faith. Uh, so, and the NIV kind of gets it right there, which again is a thought by thought translation. Uh, it, a literal translation is saving faith comes through the message of Christ. Now, very interesting, even in a Greek text, in verse 17, the word of God, it's not even the word God. It's the word Christo. That's Jesus, by the way. So it's salvation. Uh, it's a specific word of God that brings salvation to people. So again, just to help us understand this idea of rema. Rema, it's not generic. It's very specific. So secondly, uh, the best example, as I've said, uh, is Jesus in, uh, in Matthew chapter 4, also recorded in Luke chapter 4. Uh, Jesus is tested in three areas. The same areas that the enemy will attack us in, all stated in 1 John chapter 2. There, 1 John 2, 16. For all that is in the world, uh, the lust of the flesh, that's a way he can attack, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So all of these things are in contrast to the love of God. Uh, John says that we can either love God or we can love the things of the world. Uh, if we do, we're going to be attacked in terms of the lust of the flesh. This is the, again, this is the cravings of our sinful nature. Uh, it's uh, uh, our body appetites. It's a way that the enemy attacks us. We're going to see this with Jesus. Uh, the lust of the eyes. Covetousness. Always wanting more. Never, uh, never satisfied. That's, that's the way uh, the enemy can attack us. Or the pride of life, boasting of what we have or do for a living, ambitious, self-gain, and so forth. That's a way that the enemy attacks us. Again, uh, <coughs> pardon me, uh, a second NFL uh, illustration here. But uh, not football season. Shouldn't be too distracting. Nobody's thinking, what's, what's, what's that score anyway? It's, it's, it's the wrong time of year. Don't, don't start thinking about that. It's, uh, but if, if, uh, if you play defense and the other team only had three plays, you would have a pretty good day. Uh, and these are the three plays the enemy uses against us. Now let's look at Jesus. Uh, that's the way he's going to be attacked, and he's going to use the sword of the Spirit. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God... Command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, Rhema, you know, sword of the spirit. He takes it out. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into a holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, <clears throat> away with you Satan for it is written you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve then the devil left him and behold angels came uh, and ministered to him so again the first temptation uh, was the lust of the flesh the devil suggests that he turned stones uh, into bread 
the temptation is you can live independently apart from God the Father. Although Jesus said, I did not come to do my will, but the will of him who sent me and give my life as a ransom uh, for all. The hook, you're starving and you can turn stones into bread. Now when he's saying, if you are the son of God, it's a, it's a, a, a class in the Greek that means since. If and it's so. The devil knows who Jesus is. There's no confusion uh, there. Uh, again, uh, lust of the flesh. The solution here, use your powers to provide for yourself. The reason, you can't trust God the Father. After all, you're starving. If he loved you, he'd be taking care of you right now. You know, it's probably not a big temptation. Has anybody ever been tempted to turn stones into bread? See, I, I'm just thinking that maybe they're not here this morning. But uh, I've never been tempted that way. Uh, but there's certainly a uh, temptation to say, you'd better watch out for number one. You think God is really concerned about you? Uh, you think he's concerned? Look at the way you live your life. Look at the things you've done in the past. You think God really has a provision? You know, and it just goes on. These are arrows, man, and they're coming. We better get our shield up and we better get our, our sword out the way that Jesus does here. Uh, he would say, make sure your personal comforts become before the needs of others. But notice Jesus' response. He quotes Deuteronomy 8.3, uh, again from verse 4. Uh, Man shall not live by bread alone, but uh, by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I would say that was a very appropriate verse, <laughs> given what Satan is, is laying on him and tempting him with. Uh, that is a specific word of God for a very specific situation uh, that Jesus is uh, being tempted with here. That's exactly what we're talking about. <clears throat> the second temptation is the pride of life. <clears throat> it takes him to the temple, probably during a feast day, highest point of the temple. Hey, throw yourself off. <clears throat> you know, the angels will come, swoop down, <clears throat> and, you know, gather you. That'll be a tremendous display of uh, who you are. Everybody will believe you're the Messiah and so forth. It'll be an awesome event. <clears throat> but again, <clears throat> the idea is you can prove your Messiahship by doing something spectacular. Uh, throw yourself off the temple. <clears throat> the reason? Because you can't really trust God the Father to fulfill the purpose for your life. You better take things into your own hands. After all, the end will justify the means. Again, I doubt that too many of us have ever been tempted to throw ourselves off a, a high precipice. Although I have. I mean, some people are. The devil does tempt people in, in this way. Uh, and it's, uh, it could be a time of great depression, tragedy, drug use, uh, a number of things. So th this isn't uh, out of the realm in terms of a, a temptation. And it's saying that you can't go on. You might as well end it now because you can't trust God the Father for, for your future. Again, it's, uh, it's a lack of faith that uh, always uh, uh, brings us to tem point of temptation. What Jesus says, he quotes Deuteronomy 6.16, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. I, I, I probably should give a little qualifying statement. That, that was about uh, uh, yeah, 47 years ago when that, you know, and I was on LSD at the time, so that didn't help. You know, so I'm just another thing about Pastor Tim, you better keep an eye on him. <laughs> I just I thought I'd better clarify that a little bit. <laughs> What he's saying to Jesus here is that, hey, go for the glory and, uh, and not for the suffering. The third temptation, the lust of the eyes, Satan now offers Jesus the kings of the world, kingdoms of the world. Notice there's no dispute that they're, that they're not his. Again, Paul calls him the God of this age. Uh, but he says, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Again, Deuteronomy 6, uh, 13. He refused to short circuit the cross. He refused to step out of the Father's will. The psalmist says, I have hid thy word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And I think that's exactly what he was talking about uh, uh, right here. Uh, again, remember that the word of God, we can use it, it uh, to use the, the warrior uh, metaphor. It, it draws blood uh, against Satan. It's what drives uh, him away. He hates it. Uh, look, at, uh, look at 1 John 2, 14. It says, I have written to you, uh, young men, because you're strong. And the word of God abides in you, and you've overcome the wicked one. How do you overcome the wicked one? When the word of God abides in you, you become strong uh, in the word of God. 
So we need to be able to, here thirdly, use uh, the sword of the spirit ourselves. And I just kind of, <clears throat> I think this is so important. I ju I'm just going to go through some other illustrations. Here's ways that the enemy attacks us <clears throat> in ways that uh, is an appropriate response. Uh, we're, we're attacked by, by fear at times. Uh, and, uh, and, so, you know, and again, this is, uh, you know, sometimes there's legitimate reasons for being fear. Uh, this is a, a fear that is completely abnormal. <clears throat> this is waking up in the middle of the night and you're incredibly fearful and you don't even know why. Uh, this is uh, when the, the what ifs, you know, get, get the best of you uh, and, uh, and so forth. And you just become fearful. Uh, and, um, and you recognize, should hopefully recognize, <clears throat> this is a little different. It's abnormal. It's alien. These thoughts to my mind, I, I'm under attack here. Uh, and I need to do what Jesus did, what Paul instructs. I certainly need to remember I have my helmet on. I've got my shield up. I'm going to believe the promises of God. But I need to take a sword out, and it's a specific word of God. Well, one that's appropriate there is 2 Timothy 1.7. Uh, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And you recognize this fearfulness is, is not from God. It's from the devil. Uh, and I need to uh, recognize that God has given me the power of his spirit in my life, uh, his love. He's given me that discipline. It's a fruit of the spirit. Uh, I take that verse and I meditate on it. I pray through it. I bring it uh, in my mind. I don't know if you need to say it out loud or not. You might. Depends what's, uh, what's going on. Uh, Jesus did uh, in, the, uh, in that warfare with uh, the enemy there. It might be uh, just a, a general sense of weakness that, uh, uh, again, you feel like you have a sense of weakness uh, in your life that's way out of the ordinary. Well, an appropriate uh, specific word for that would be 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I'm actually strong. Uh, again, that, that would be a, a very specific word of God. Again, it's not my words. It's not going to really help me any. Uh, it's not how much faith I've got. It's not any of that stuff. It's the Bible. It's, it's Bible verses that apply to a, attack by the enemy. Uh, and again, uh, th th these are things that we go through, uh, and they just, be, they just may be part of life. You know, you just, you know, two flat tires on the same day, you know, uh, it, that, that'll just kind of throw you off your game. Uh, it, it may or may not mean you're under spiritual attack, uh, but sometimes we just need to recognize what's really going on uh, in our hearts and minds. Uh, anxiety. <laughs> and... Um, uh, doesn't play anybody here, but you might have friends that go through this someday. If you find yourself in a great deal of anxiety, uh, Matthew 6.34. Uh, Therefore, do not worry about uh, tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day uh, is its own trouble. I, I, I just kind of, let's confess, I, I kind of use this a lot here, you know. You know, that whole kind of, I, I just love it. There's a little tongue-in-cheek here of, of Jesus saying, <clears throat> you know, don't worry about tomorrow. Let tomorrow worry about itself. I like that idea, you know, because my tendency is to worry about tomorrow and even the next day and the next day uh, and the next day. Now, the promise here that we would hold up in terms of our shield is the preceding verse, kind of the classic, Matthew 6, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these other things will be added unto you. What's the other things? <laughs> the things you're anxious about, primarily. And we talked about that last week, that, uh, that uh, in most studies, it's in, it's in the high 90 percent, uh, over 92 percent of the things that we worry about never happen. They, they never even occur. And um, I remember a number of years ago, there was uh, <coughs> a visiting pastor in town, Baptist guy, and uh, I was getting together with the other, uh, some other pastors uh, from Kaidu at the time. We'd get together once a month, have lunch, and pray together. And this guy was... Uh, Man, his voice sounded exactly like J. Vernon McGee. And, of course, you have to maybe hear J. Vernon McGee. You have to appreciate it. And he was, he was from Texas. He was from East Texas. He had the, the exact same guy accent. Uh, he was an older guy. And uh, I, you know, I, I just, you know, he gave me a ride home after one of the things. And I, I, just, I just had to say to him, and I can't remember his name right now. I said, you know, I don't know if anyone's ever said this to you, but, boy, you sure sound like J. Vernon McGee. He goes, oh, yeah. People say that to me all the time, I, but they never say you preach like him. <laughs> and uh, I was a younger guy. I said, hey, can you give me, uh, 
you know, just uh, you know, a little bit of advice as a young guy just started out in the ministry. He said, oh, yeah, I'd be happy to. He says, here's a good piece of advice. If I were you, I would just give up on worrying. He says, my wife and I, we just give it up. It's just too much for us. We just plump give it up. Just give up the worry. It's, it's a little easier said than done, isn't it? <laughs> we talked about that. You know, the Philippian passage, we can take it off the worry list and put it on the prayer list. It has a sense to keep jumping back. But sometimes it's more than that. It's really uh, in a spiritual attack. If you're dealing with condemnation <clears throat> from the enemy, and we've mentioned this already, there in Romans uh, 8, uh, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. This is all the same. In spiritual warfare, you kind of need to be memorizing some scripture. It's not just for Sunday school kids uh, and, uh, and on a pretty regular basis. But I'll tell you, if, if you're going through this and you can't quite shake it, you, uh, you, you go to your Bible, you go to concordance, and look through, you find a verse that speaks to you that's specific for your situation. You write it down on a little card, you put it in your top pocket. And uh, when that feeling and that whole thing is coming against you, you just take it out and read through it again and believe and trust God and you pray through it. You do that for a couple of days, you'll have that verse memorized. Because, you know, there's a lot of verses I know. I don't even know how I know. I think it's because I've read them over so many times. Now, you, it's not a bad thing. And I do that every day. I sit down and I have my memorization. I, I go through it and stuff. I'm, uh, I'm kind of hoping it'll help me later. <laughs> this memor memory thing, you know. But uh, I'm hoping, you know, I could be the guy that sits in the corner of the room and he just says Bible verses all the time. <laughs> Who's that? I don't know. I must have been a pastor one time. <laughs> Only thing he says is something from the Bible. <laughs> could be. Could be me. But uh, in the meantime, I find it uh, very, very helpful. We need the proper armor. We need the proper weapons. Uh, again, uh, the 2 Corinthians 10, 3, that... Uh, you know, we, we do not wage war like the world does. Our weapons are not the weapons of this world. They have divine power to demolish strongholds. Uh, and that's what we're talking about here. I just want to read one more passage. This is a very young David before uh, Goliath. And uh, as he goes out against uh, the giant, uh, 1 Samuel 17, 45. And I'm reading it out of the... Uh, <coughs> NIV, just because I wanted to. I, I just like the sound of it. Uh, David said to the Philistine, uh, You come with me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air uh, and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. And that, that, that's the thing to end on. That ultimately, the battle is the Lord. Uh, and this is all going to kind of get bound up together in the very important subject we'll look at next week of prayer. As, uh, as Paul ends this section on spiritual warfare. Thank you.